an electronic structure, yes, okay. <laughs> what have we done in particular? Well, we were looking at Hartree Fock versus density function theory, and we were looking at things they have in common and which are different. Okay? And uh, today I would like to focus on something which, in principle, we have already done, because all the equations of the key equations of TFT and of Hartree Fock, you've seen them, and they are correct, and we don't need to correct them. But there is something which has always appeared in the equations and at least I have never kind of put really a, an emphasis on it. And this is the question of spin and magnetism. Okay? So spin and magnetism is there in all you have seen so far and in principle would not need to, do, to talk about this but I have the distinct feeling that one has to kind of to underline a little bit where the spin and magnetism comes into play. Okay? So, and I'm doing this now because now you've seen all the basic equations, but I'm also doing it now in the context of comparing Hartree Fock and DFT because the spin and magnetism they appear in a very similar way but slightly different, nevertheless, in those two theories. So, spin and magnetism. And uh, So the ideas which we will be talking about are extremely similar. So first question is, why is there uh, magnetism? Why does it appear? So you know, some materials are magnetic. Iron is magnetic. Cobalt is magnetic. So on. Like in a bigger scale, in a smaller scale, it's a charged motion. That causes magnetism. Yes, but spin. charge and motion is in fact something we will not look at here. Spin. Spin orbit. It is spin. So the magnetism, in, so kind of the most important effects of magnetism, and these are the only ones we will be talking about here, are due to spin. Because every electron carries a spin one half, which can be pointing in any direction, and this might lead in a material to magnetism. Okay? This is not the only reason why a system can be magnetic, as you pointed out. There's also something which is not related to spin, but to so-called orbital magnetism. So you could have a material where you have kind of electronic currents flowing, and this leads to um, uh, an angular momentum, and angular momentum is open magnetic moment. Okay? So it could be that kind of, if, as you say, currents are flowing, and this leads to, to magnetism, and this goes under the general topic orbital magnetism, which however we will not treat. Orbital magnetism is, in, in, in normal cases, mu a much weaker, and very often it is zero, simply because in the ground state, and we are interested in the ground state, normally no currents are flowing. Okay? And also you have kind of a symmetry which makes that there are no global currents flowing if the system is sitting down in its ground state. So there, typically, the key effect which leads to magnetism is spin. Okay? So we know it comes from the fact that every electron carries this spin one half of the bit. But now let's dive a little bit into what we've seen in the last weeks. We've done Hartree Fock, density functional theory, you've seen the equations. We've seen a Hamiltonian after having done, ah, besides, on Monday when there was this famous talk about uh, um, quantum information and so on, have you seen that? Eh? Yeah. Born Oppenheimer was there, yeah. and uh, <laughs> the electronic structure Hamiltonian, and they have shown how they try to solve our problem by doing a quantum computation. Eh? But I was happy to see that at least until I retire, these things will not be usable as an alternative to events division here in Africa. So you are younger than me, so you will perhaps see it. Okay. So, but jokes apart, um, so we have seen the equations which govern Hartree Fock, which govern DFT. In those equations, where did you see the spin? Hartree-Fock, it's in the spin orbit, it's inside band. Where was spin orbit in Hartree-Fock? Like when you're creating the determinants. Yes. So we ah, you mean the spin orbitals? Yeah. I, am, I, miss, I miss that. Yeah, yeah. So this is what we have said here. The spin orbitals, they are spin up or spin down. But then they are governed by a Hamiltonian. No? I mean, either if you look at the many body picture by the Born Oppenheimer Hamiltonian or by the Hartree Fokker DFT Hamiltonian in the single particle picture. Was there spin anywhere in those Hamiltonians? 
No. Precisely because with the non-relativistic approach, so we do not have L times S, we do not have the spin-orbit coupling yet, um, and we will not have it today. But so the question is, if the Hamiltonian does not depend on spin, as it does in all we've done, why should a system be magnetic? Okay. So it's true, yes, every, every, spin, every electron carries a spin and every spin orbital describes a spin one half particle, but in order for the total system to be magnetic, there should be the, the spin up orbitals should feel a different or should satisfy a different equation than the spin down orbitals. No? Otherwise, there is no reason why those behave differently from those and why there is a net magnetism. So it seems a bit strange if one just starts thinking like this spin and magnetism and one thinks about what we have seen so far. Why should spin up and spin down not be exactly the same? Why should there, why, why should there arise any, any magnetism? Okay. So you remember, for example, if you do hardy fock same as DFT, you solve the hardy fock at DFT Hamiltonian, you get eigenvalues, you remember eigenstates by I, and you fill them. And we said, okay, we fill them either like this, okay, in this case clearly you have no magnetism if you have an even number of electrons. Or you might have different states for, say, oh, spin up might be like this, so that the other spin downs might look like this, and you fill those. Here we could understand why a system is magnetic, because the states are different for a spin up and for a spin down. The question is, why should the energy levels be different for spin up and spin down? You see the problem? We have a Hamiltonian, and these are eigenstates of Hamiltonian. Explicitly, spin does not appear in the Hamiltonian. But in order to have different levels, we must have different equations. If it's the same equation for spin up and for spin down, the solution must be the same. So any idea where this difference comes from? There is a splitting over the main Hamiltonian. Uh, Which Hamiltonian? OK, so we have this Hamiltonian that we took. Let's say just our vital part uh, that mm -hmm. we yes. took. Mm -hmm. so we usually add perturbations to, so this Hamiltonian will give us the backbone of the energy, or yeah, this energy levels. Uh -huh. So we will add some perturbations depending on, yeah. for example, so one thing is yes, you might add a perturbation if you calculate spin orbit coupling, you might put L times S with yes. a constant, and then this you can treat perturbatively. I agree. But even if you do not add anything perturbatively, I mean, if you do in iron, okay, you have an iron containing system, we know it will be ferromagnetic. We know that the spin up and the spin down will have different energy levels. Why can they be different if they have our solutions to the same equation? This is the question. Okay? And the answer is, well, the equations are not the same for spin up and spin down. And this is what I would like to figure out today with you. So why, so one of the questions we can ask, so, Yes, the magnetism comes from the spin which every electron carries around. But in order to have a net spin, the energy levels should be such that it's more advantageous to put, for example, more electrons in spin up than in spin down. How can it be more advantageous? Only if spin up and spin down satisfy different equations. And now, in fact, I will rewrite the equations we've already seen. They are all correct to show you explicitly that, yes, spin up and spin down electrons satisfy different equations. And this we will now see. So, and the approach is extremely similar in DFT and hard reform, even though the result is a little bit different. Okay? So we plug ourselves in these two worlds. In both of these worlds, we have these single particle orbitals. Okay? In, the, in hard reform, we make a determinant out of them. In density function theory, they are the fictitious Kohn-Sham orbitals used for the density. So I will write those single particle orbitals as, so here I use a lowercase psi i. Okay. I have often used phi, but now that we talk about spin in order not to mix up things, the psi are the spin orbitals. So this is orbital and it has an index i obviously so we have as many as we have electrons 
And then this here depended in our notations in the past on x. No? So we've always written psi i of x, if you look at the equations. But now today we would really make everything with the spin explicit to see where differences come from. And when I introduced you what is x, I said x is a combined index which is a position in space, which I call r, and a spin index which is up or down. Okay? So this here we can also write, so the spin orbitals, they depend explicitly on a position and on sigma. And sigma can take only two values. So sigma, this here is, I, I can either call it up or down, or let me call it plus, minus. Or you could call it zero and one, or minus one half plus one, whatever. So it can, sigma can take two values, so let me call it plus and minus. Okay? I do not mean with plus minus that the sign of this becomes negative or something. I mean with plus I mean spin up, with minus I mean spin down. Okay? You could choose a different way of writing it, but this is what I mean. Okay? So we have a spin orbital, it has an index, which is an integer number, and we have as many of them as we have electrons. Each spin orbital depends on position, and if I look at its spin up or spin down component. Okay. So, again, hand-waving, it seems trivial, but I would like to stress this again. So, the arguments which are here, r and sigma, these are the position and spin channel I'm looking at to understand what is this kind of orbit. Okay. So, this orbital is well defined. I look at it at the position r and in spin channel sigma. Okay. The i is what distinguishes different orbitals. Okay. Now we have said we are looking only at worlds where the spin can only be up and down. In principle, the spin can also point in the x or y or whatever direction, but let us, it's already complicated enough, to restrict ourselves to all spins in the c direction being up or down. This is why, <coughs> and so we restrict our formulations. spin parallel to the c direction. In this case, we can say that our psi i of r and sigma is a function which I call phi. Now, here I make the distinction between the psi, which is the spin orbital, and the phi, which is the orbital in space. Okay. If sigma is plus and zero if sigma is minus. Okay. So in this case, if sigma, so, and this here is the case for S of i equals plus. Okay? So i, we set labels which electron or which orbital I'm looking at. Okay? And each orbital is describing a spin up or a spin down electron. Okay? So this is what I mean here. If the spin of the spin orbital number i is up, then the shape of it is such that it has a shape in space if you're looking at the sigma plus channel and zero if you're looking at the down channel. For S of i e minus, so if this is a spin orbital of a spin down electron, then the spin orbital F i of r and sigma is zero if I say the sigma is plus and it is phi, so I must put here the same index, phi i of r. <coughs> If you're looking at the minus. Okay. So this means we have two classes of spin orbitals. Okay. We have, in total we have n of them. We have a certain number of them which are such that the spin of them is a plus spin. Then it is in the, in the plus channel a function of space and zero in the minus channel. Or you have a spin down electron. Then you have in the spin up channel zero and the spin down channel some function of space. Okay? 
So in the following, always the phi's will know the function of space, irrespective of spin, and the psi know the spin orbital where you have additionally these things. Now this specialty that I only look for spin parallel to C, this is the fact that uh, my, my spin orbitals, which in principle are a, a two-component vector, is always something zero or zero something. Okay. In principle, you could have a two-component sp um, so-called spinner, a spin orbital, which is non-zero in the up and non-zero in the down. Okay. And then if you ask yourself, in which direction is the spin, you would have to calculate the spin orbital with one of the sigma x, y, or c. So the expectation value of the, the spin operator. This here would be a Pauli matrix. Okay. So if this here is a two-component vector, here you have a two-by-two two matrix, and this. And we have chosen, because we consider spins only parallel to c, we say that our spin orbitals are eigenfunction of sigma z, which is, as you all know, 1, 0, 0, minus 1. Okay? So this here is an eigenfunction of sigma z with the eigenvalue plus 1, and this here is an eigenfunction of sigma z with minus 1. Okay? So saying that we consider only spins parallel to c, okay, allows us to write this. And this is rather general. It is only in very special materials, which have a special geometry and so on, you will have what is called non-collinear magnetism. So magnetism where all spins sometimes point in various directions. But as a general rule, in most of the cases, in all which interests us, it's enough to allow the speed to be polarized in one direction, say the C direction, doesn't it? Okay. Yes. Uh, is this like SI equals to plus and sigma equals to plus giving different informations? Yes, because um, this here, no one says that this kind of shape, which this spin up element, must have also exist in a spin down channel. Okay? So, the, um, if, if we say we fill our orbitals like this, okay, then this orbital which corresponds to this, this space orbital, would in one spin orbital like this, and it would the same shape in space would appear in another as a down channel. But here we do not say this. Here we allow, in fact, that a given shape in space, which is defined here, never ever appears anywhere in the down channel. Okay? So the special case where you have everything doubly occupied will be a special case we look later. But first let us write the, kind of the general spin stuff. So we generalize this in this. So again, and this is something which also for me it was in the beginning these notations a bit difficult. Remember, each i no denotes a given spin orbital. And each spin orbital we force it to be either spin up or spin down spin orbital. For each irrespective, if you know that the spin of i is plus or minus, sigma can take any of the two values. Hmm? But if you take sigma has the value which does not correspond to the spin of this orbital, then it is zero. Okay. This is very important for what we'll follow now. But let me now kind of use these notations again with the x, which you have seen so far, and go explicitly to spin in the example of um, of a scalar product. Okay. For example, when we said the spin orbitals must be um, orthonormal, we were always calculating things like psi i, psi j. No? These appear and we said this must be delta i j. But what do we mean by writing a scalar product like this? Well, we mean obviously an integral over all space. So what I have written before, in the old notation, this was an integral d3x, and then I've written psi i complex conjugate of x times psi j of x. Okay? This was what the old notation, or the, the shorthand notation. What this really means was a sum over space and a sum over sigma being plus or minus of 
psi i complex conjugate of r and sigma and psi j of r and sigma. Okay? So the integrals in all equations we have had previously, we have had an integral over x. What you really meant is an integral over space and a sum over sigma. And for a scalar product, we take both orbitals at the same. But now look, imagine that i and j describe two spin orbitals which have different spin. Okay? For example, if i is an up spin spin orbital and j is a down spin spin orbital. Okay? In that case, this function here is non-zero only if sigma is plus. Okay? But if sigma is plus, then here you have zero. If on the other hand sigma is um, minus, then this here is zero and you get it. So automatically a scalar product between two spin orbitals which describe different spins is zero because always whatever sigma is as a value, either this is zero or this is zero. Okay? So this here is always zero if the spin of i is different from the spin of j. And it is equal to simply the integral over all space of phi i of r of x conjugate phi j of r if they have the same spin. trivial but it will be important now when we write down when we look again at what our energies here. So now let's look for example what the kinetic energy looks like. Psi i complex conjugate of x, the second derivative, um, and then we had psi i of x. But now we know that the integral over x is an integral over space plus the sum sigma being up down. Let me write it explicitly. Sum sigma is plus or minus, and then we have the sum over all i integral over space, and we have simply the part of space phi r to the second derivative phi r. Here we have two different indices. Here we have only one index in every one, i. Okay? So i obviously has the same spin as itself. Okay? So here you do not have anything if the two spins are the same. No, the spin of this is always the same. Okay? And in fact, so therefore, the sigma here does not even appear. So it is for each spin orbital the kinetic energy you would expect of the space part. Okay? And then, if, uh, if spin up is, um, is there, then you obtain this function for spin down nothing, or you obtain nothing for spin up and obtain something for spin down. Okay? So, in fact, here we have this here, and so this here becomes simply given by the space. Uh, 
chart of the coordinates. The way I've written it um, so is, is wrong because written like this, a factor of two would appear. Okay? Because this is independent of spin. Here you have a sum over two things which will appear and you would get a factor of two. So let me write it better. This here of R and sigma. This is R and sigma. And these here are the sides. Okay, so, and now if sigma is up for a spin up electron, then you obtain what we have just had the part with the phi's, and nothing for the sigma is down. Or if i is a spin down, then you do not obtain anything if sigma is plus, and you obtain the space part of it's down. Okay? So this here is what we've just had. No sum over this, but sum over all the space part. Phi i star gradient. So kinetic energy is simply given by the space part of the function to sum over all of it. The same without writing it will be for the external potential. There is nothing here. Let us look at the two interesting parts of the energy in Hartree-Fock, which is exchange and uh, Hartree, okay? because these are the two electron parts. So let me write down first the Hartree part. So the way we had written E Hartree was one half if you look back at the, your notation. Then we had a sum over i and j. We had two integrals, p3x, p3x prime. And then we had psi i of x complex conjugate times psi i of x. And we have psi j complex conjugate of x prime times psi j complex conjugate. So without complex conjugate of x prime divided by r minus r prime. This is what we have written. Okay. Now we write this explicitly with the spins. This will give us. 1 half sum over i and j, sum over sigma and sigma prime, double integral d3r, d3r prime. Okay. So we have here I had x and x prime. So we obtain r and r prime and sigma and sigma prime. This is again just the distance. Here we have psi i complex conjugate of r and sigma, psi i of r and sigma, and here we obtain psi j r prime sigma prime, psi j. And here again, you see it happens exactly like in the kinetic energy. If sigma is up, then if i has is described as spin up, spin off, then you obtain simply the norm squared of the space part and nothing for sigma down. If i instead is a spin down electron, then you obtain nothing for sigma is plus and you obtain the space part for sigma down. So for each of the orbitals, we will always obtain the norm square of the space part here and here also. Okay? So also this here looks like the kinetic energy. No spin seems to appear. Okay? 
So this here is therefore simply, as we would have guessed, sum over i and j. These are the integrals of x away. We have t three r, t three r prime, and here we have the norm of phi i and r squared times the norm j and r prime squared divided by r. So also in Hartree, we have not found anything which would, where the equations would be different for a spin up with respect to spin down. So if we are looking for some, some difference, let's hope that in the last part that we have not yet written down, something appears, and that will be the case. And this is the exchange part. Okay? So in the exchange, Write uh, it with the, the um, with the sigmas also, so sum over sigma and sigma prime integral over space d three r d three r prime, and now we obtain psi i at r and sigma times psi j complex conjugate at the same position, and here we obtain psi j at r prime sigma prime times psi i complex conjugate at r prime prime divided by the distance. Now the situation is different because, in principle, i and j can have can describe spin orbitals with the same spin or with different spin. So, if they have different spins, but we are always looking at each of the two orbitals here with sigma being either plus or being minus. If the two have different spins, then always one of these two factors is zero. Either for, so if this is up spin, this is down spin, then the up channel, this is non zero, but this is zero, and the down channel, this is zero, this is not zero, so, but you have always zero here. Here it's exactly the same. Sigma prime can be whatever it wants, but if i and j describe electrons with different spin, you obtain always zero. Okay. So this is very different from what we have had here, because here you do, we did not have any dependence on the spin. But here now we obtain, as a consequence, that you have a contribution to exchange only between electrons which have the same spin. So this means we obtain minus one half sum over ij the two integrals. But now, so we can write, the contribution is only if is non zero only if spin of i is the same as spin of j. Okay. So you have a double sum. Only those elements count where the spin is the same. And in that case, you have the usual expression phi i of r phi j complex conjugate at r phi j at r prime phi i complex. Okay. So you have this contribution 
according to IJ, as we've already said, but only between electrons with the same spin. So, now what we are looking for, remember, is the reason why spin up and spin down electrons satisfy different equations. So far we have not written which equations the phi is satisfied. We have only written the energy. So the equations, remember, come from the Hartree Fock Hamiltonian, comes from calculating the functional derivative of E, say Hartree Fock, with respect to a spin orbital taken at the number k at position r and spin sigma. Remember, when we were deriving the equations, we were calculating something like this. And uh, we had here of k and x. So again, I write explicitly. And we already know that this will lead, in all the other terms except exchange, <coughs> it will not depend on sigma because we found an expression for the energy which is independent of it. Okay? So we obtain something which is minus a bar squared divided by 2m, the second derivative plus some external potential of r plus some half the potential of r, like we have derived it before, times psi k at r and sigma. Ah, sorry, I've forgotten the most important part. Plus, let me write here, this here times psi But now the exchange part, the way which we will derive in a second, will be a function of space, but it will also have an index C. Okay. So you are deriving this thing, and as a function, if you apply it on a spin up or a spin down, you will have a different exchange. Why this? Because functional derivative of the exchange energy, as it is written here, with respect to psi k at conjugate at r and sigma, gives what? So we can look here. Okay. So we can have k is either i or j, will give you the same term. So if j equals k, then we derive with respect to this here. Okay. One sum remains, the sum over i, and the sum over sigma prime. So this here remains the sum over i and the sum over sigma prime. Okay. So here we have r and sigma remain the same. So here we will have psi i. at r and sigma, then, this is this part here, here we will have the same psi i complex conjugate with r prime and sigma prime, And we have here, this is psi k at r prime sigma. Okay. So 
So this here is the sum over sigma prime. So and the integral is over r. So here the integral over r has disappeared because it is fixed by the coordinate by which we derive by this term here. And the minus goes away, and I've forgotten one minus sign. And this we can write as sum over sigma prime, sum over r prime. Here we have now n r, and I have forgotten the most important thing. No, this bit here. Sum over i goes from 1 to n. Psi i of r and sigma, psi i complex conjugate of r prime sigma prime. And this here is what we call the exchange potential between r and r prime and sigma sigma prime. times psi k and r prime. So all I've done is deriving this part here. to write this in terms of the space orbitals. Here comes now what in this case has led to the fact that we have exchange only between the same spin orbitals. What you discover here is if i and k um, have different spins, okay, then this product here will always be zero because here you have sigma prime and here you have sigma prime. So the same spin. So you're looking at sigma prime, for example, the up channel, if this is a spin up and this is a down, then this is always zero. Or if you're looking sigma prime is the down channel, then one of the, the other one will be zero and the other one not zero. Okay? So again, this thing here leads to the fact that the spin of i must be the same as the spin of, J, uh, of k. Otherwise, the contribution is clearly zero. And therefore, we do not need this sum here anymore, okay? because this sum here will simply lead us to the fact that we have here the, these taken as the same thing. So we obtain, therefore, that this is um, integral over d3 prime. We exchange between sigma sigma prime times phi k r prime and this here I write the sigma times delta s of k and sigma okay so we see that the spin part here must be the same as here, and Vx is with only one spin indice, index, sigma is the sum over all orbitals, but only those orbitals where delta, where the spin of i is sigma, and for them you calculate the, um, this, this term here, phi i, R by I of R prime divided by minus R. So for my hand writing this looks like upside down.
Okay? So we have two different potentials. One in which we uh, sum only about the space part of the spin up orbitals, and another ex uh, exchange potential where we sum only those spin orbitals which have the down part. Huh. Now we see that, in fact, remember this here is the Hamiltonian, the, uh, the Harvey Fock Hamiltonian. And now this Hamiltonian is different if you're looking at the spin up or the spin down electron. So this here will depend on a sigma. As always, the Harvey Fock Hamilton depends on the orbital, so depends on its solutions. But it is different if, um, if it acts on a spin up than on a spin down um, orbital. Why? Because in one case the exchange part is done only by those orbitals which are spin up, in the other case it's done by those which are spin down. Okay? And since now spin up and spin down orbitals have a different single particle Hamiltonian, then if you calculate for the spin up ones, h psi is epsilon psi, you find other eigenvalues and eigenfunctions than for the spin down part. And this is the reason why you can in principle have for sigma e plus plus some energy levels and for sigma equals minus some different energy values okay, which are not necessarily the same because you have a different Hamiltonian for them. And like in this case you would then fill in this here with an up, this with an up, this with an up, this with a down if you for example fear four electrons and you see you have you can have that you have more spin up than spin down. That's a function for this eigenvalues line. So in Hartley Fock, the thing comes that all spin effect and the fact that this thing can be spin polarized comes only from the exchange. All the other parts of the energy are independent of spin, and the spin up and spin down will feel the same Hartley potential, the same kinetic energy, the same external potential, which is kind of normal. Okay? So if there is a nucleus sitting here and exerting its 1 over r potential on an electron, it does not care if the electron is a spin up or spin down electron, it feels exactly the same nucleus. However, since the exchange is only with other electrons which have the same spin, then, yes, they, feel, uh, they can feel different fields amongst themselves, and that this is why this part in the Hamilton is different, therefore the Hamiltonian is different. Okay. So now, so this is happening in case of uh, Hartley Fock. Later we will see that density function theory is nearly the same. And we have seen in the exchange potential what counts is now the separate sum of all spin ups with respect to the spin downs. And this is why one introduces generally something which is n plus is the number of occupied spin up or the spin orbitals. while n minus is the number of occupied spin down spin orbitals. And then you can very easily say, obviously, the total number of electrons must be the number of n plus plus the number n minus. And you can also say something interesting, what is called the magnetization, is the difference. This is the total magnetization of your system. How many more electrons are there? So you can either say m, that you obtain a number, or you can multiply this with mu d, which is the magnetic moment of one electron, and then this is in new orders of magnetic moment, <coughs> as you want. So in the literature, you find both definitions. Sometimes people define m, the magnetization, as a number, 
and one must know, okay, this number tells you so many more spin up than spin down electrons, or it is multiplied by mu b. In this case, it is really a magnetic moment. And then we can now also define, remember we have the density, which was always defined as the sum over the modulus square of the space part of our orbitals. And now one defines also a spin-up density, which is sum over all orbitals. But you count them only if the spin of i is plus of the modulus square. And n minus is the sum, precisely the other ones, where the spin of i is minus and the sum over i. You can very well have that, for example, n minus is zero. If you have only spin up electrons, then, for example, you have n plus this term. And then you have also here, obviously, that n of r is n plus of r plus n minus of r and m of r which is the magnetization now it, which can be given at every point in space is n plus of r minus n minus okay. this could be now the magnetization at each point in space this is the total magnetization of your system and you can look where is, for example, you have a complicated hook molecule. Yesterday, I don't know if anyone was at the condensed matter seminar. There was a seminar about the spin of hemoglobin, about the magnetic moment. Hemoglobin is a large protein, which we all have in our blood, which contains iron. This is why doctors measure our iron content, which is very important. Okay, so in hemoglobin, there's iron, it's magnetic. And then we can look if you, for example, a large molecule like hemoglobin, you could look where is the magnetism, so you could calculate m as a function of space, and then you would find that it is non-zero mainly around the, the iron, which is inside the protein. So one can therefore calculate also the magnetic structure resolved in space, all thanks to this. And then there is something where, which is called restricted Hartree-Fock. Or it's, uh, it exists also restricted density function theory. Very often this is used. This is uh, used if one already knows that one has to do with non-magnetic systems. In this case, one can, before one starts minimizing and looking for a solution, one can constrain your system, constrain, um, your solution, to the following, to saying that we have the same number n plus as n minus, which is just half of the total number of electrons. Okay. And then you can say that you force your system such that the space part of orbital of, of i is the same, no, I have to write it off, of all pair electrons, so 2i is the same as the space part of all odd ones. So each space part appears twice, okay? once for the orbital 1 and once for the orbital 2. Okay? So you have the same number, up and down electrons, and each orbital will be occupied exactly by 2. Okay? And the, the spin of um, orbital number 2i is always the same as the spin of orbital 2 i minus 1. Oh, 
sorry, it's not the same thing. It's, it's the opposite. So it's minus. Okay. So orbital one has spin orbital one has the same shape in space as spin orbital number two, but the opposite spin. So one and two the same, then three and four the same, five and six the same. Okay, it is so. This is why one calls it restricted, okay? Because you restrict your your space part of the orbitals to be the same for spin ups and spin down, and moreover, you you restrict yourself to having the same number. Then this means if you take the n plus of r, okay, where again you count only those with the plus, the space part you will obtain exactly the same as n minus, because you have the same um, space parts which are appearing. So n plus is the same as n minus. Moreover, you will have that the exchange potential of sigma equals plus is the same as the exchange potential of sigma equals minus. Again, because you have the sum over all orbitals, you have the same number of orbitals appearing, and also in this case, then the same orbitals in each one are appearing, and therefore you have these two. But if this is the case, it means that the hartree cock Hamiltonian of sigma is plus is the same as the hartree cock Hamiltonian of sigma b minus. And therefore, by construction, we have this case. Where we have the same orbitals and each one is structured. So most of the calculations in fact we are doing, except that you know that either you have an odd number of electrons, if the number of electrons is not an even number, then you, have, then you obviously cannot do this. So if the number of electrons is odd, then you cannot do restricted EFT. But if you have an even number of electrons, and you know, because you know which elements are there, if there's no iron, no transition metal, and you probably know that things are what was it closed shell, then you can, without further calculations, directly go to this. The big advantage is you have to deal only with half the number of orbitals. Okay? And then if you calculate n, you simply calculate n plus, and you can put a 2 in front of it. I said DFT is nearly the same. So also in DFT we have single particle orbitals, single particle spin orbitals, which are now our cone sharp orbitals. For them, they're all is the same as what we've done so far. If you write the DFT energy, we have like an Hartree Fock, the kinetic energy, no spin. We have the external part of the energy, no spin, because it's exactly the same as in Hartree Fock. We have a hard to determine the energy of DFT, like here, spin does not appear, so all is like in non-magnetic DFT. But now there is always our difficult part, which is exchange correlation. Okay? In DFT, the magnetic effects, like in Hartree Fock, they all come from the exchange part. Now in uh, Hartree in DFT, they come from exchange correlation. So in DFT. The magnetic terms arise from exchange correlation. So we know that this complicated exchange correlation energy it's a functional of n. But the truth is it is a functional of n plus and n minus of these two. So you have a spin up density, you have a spin down density, and the exchange correlation effect depends on both of them. Sometimes it is written in a different way, sometimes it's written E exchange correlation, which depends on the total density and on this magnetization density which we have defined before. You find both kind of notations around. 
And the nice thing is, obviously, we need to approximate this thing. Like we did it in the non-magnetic case, also here we will have to approximate it. And the approximation is exactly the, goes again, again in the exactly same way as in the non-magnetic case. Remember, in the non-magnetic case, we said E exchange correlation was approximately, if you do the local density approximation, given by a sum over all space, locally the density at that point in space, time exchange correlation of n at that point in space. Okay? And we said this here is derived from a homogeneous electron gas. So from a system of which you know the energy, where at every point in space the density is exactly the same. Okay. Now, <clears throat> if it's magnetic, you also refer yourself to the homogeneous electron gas, so where at every point in space you have the same density, but now one is looking at polarized homogeneous electron gases. So one can look at homogeneous electron gases, and we can also solve them exactly, where you have more spin up than spin down electrons, so it is magnetically polarized, but again it is constant everywhere in space. Also for those, one can, with Juan to Monte Carlo and other techniques, calculate the exact energy. And one is plugging here in the magnetic case. One is simply replacing this with E exchange correlation of N plus at this point in space and N minus at this point in space. So one is using the exchange correlation energy density of a homogeneous electron gas, which has everywhere in space the same density and magnetization as our real system has at that point in space. And, and this is then called E exchange correlation. If one does this approximation, it has a different name. Here one puts N up. Still it is a, obviously a local approximation and this is called, I'm not talking about drugs here, but it is really called LSD. <laughs> this is called local spin density. So this is again the most common approximation one uses in the magnetic case. LDA becomes LSD, local spin density, and the things are nearly the same. Obviously, like in Hartree-Fock, the fact that the exchange correlation term now depends on nR plus and n minus leads to the fact that if you take the functional derivative with respect to the Cauchy-Sharm orbital to minimize it, you obtain a different a spin uh, spin up part in the Hamiltonian than a spin down part in the Hamiltonian. So, exactly like in Hartree-Fock, we will obtain that. The Hamiltonian depends on the spin, and the spin up spin contram orbitals will feel a different Hamiltonian than the spin down spin orbitals. So also, here one does the functional derivative of the DFT energy, which depends on like n plus and n minus with respect to a Cohn-Sharm orbital number k, complex conjugate at a position r, uh, this here leads to a DFT Hamiltonian, which depends on sigma times psi k of r and sigma will be epsilon so again here you have a spin dependent Hamilton, exactly like we've just seen before in half before, and the difference between the spin up and the spin down is only in the exchange correlation potential. Because you will have that the functional derivative of E exchange correlation with respect to n plus is different from the n minus. Good. 
So any questions to this kind of thing? So this is the most important part for magnetism and spin which arises. It's due to the spins of each electron, then uh, due to the fact which we have seen, either exchange or DFT exchange correlation, we have a, a term in Hamiltonian which changes according to if you are talking about spin up and spin down. Therefore, the spin orbitals satisfy different equations, different eigenvalue equations. They can, in principle, be different, and therefore you obtain different solutions, and the system can be mapped. In the very beginning, and I remind you of this, we have said there are different kinds of um, uh, there, are, there are different kinds of magnetism which can arise. This is the most important one. There is also orbital magnetism which can arise. Or we can introduce non-relativistic effects by adding spin-orbit interactions, which is typically done in a, in a perturbative way. So one can go ahead and ahead. I could give you a whole uh, a course only on magnetic effects and uh, density functional field. But this here, what we've seen today, is the most important reason for it. It comes, in fact, from the exchange. I mean, exchange correlation also depends on spin because also, it has to capture somehow the exchange, and this is really the exchange, which is only between likewise spins, and this is what makes things different. Okay, so let me just finish by saying what the next steps are. So on Friday we have one lesson. I will in the beginning tell you the mo what are the most important functions which are in fact used. So the most important we have seen, LDA and LSD, local dense approximation. But this is obviously not the last word. This was the first thing which has been invented, is still very much used. And th then people have over the years systematically improved these functions. And there is something which is called a Jacob's Ladder. I don't know if you know uh, um, uh, the mytho how do you say in English? methodology of a ladder which goes to heaven and you arrive in paradise and people have developed this Jacob's ladder for functionals. So the first rung of this ladder going towards paradise of calculating everything exactly would be LDA. The next rung then is adding gradient corrections, we will see this, then the next rung is adding even more. So there are different rungs of Jacob's ladder. Every time the function becomes more complicated to evaluate and typically the functions also become better. So I will a little bit explain to you what kind of improvements to the simple LDA functions exist. This will be the first part next time. In the second part, I will talk about pseudopotentials, which is a very important thing for anyone who is doing in calculations, especially with plane waves in practice. This we will start on Friday, but probably not completely finish on Friday, and then on Monday we finish that. And then I show you in kind of here on the computer, how it really looks if you do a DFT calculation in a code. So I will here with the screen and so on kind of show you in a very easy case how, how a code in fact does these, all these things we have seen. Okay? So that is kind of the, uh, the end of the lecture. Okay? So on Friday, functionals and uh, pseudopotentials. Okay? Good. Buon appetito. <laughs>